All right, we are going to get started, and I'm sure that people are going to come and join us um, as we're talking, but um, feel free to, at any time during the presentation, unmute yourself, ask questions. Uh, you can always text questions in the chat box. Uh, this is meant to be fun for you and educational, so anything that you need to know, just let me know. And uh, without further ado, we'll get started. Uh, my name is Julia Holman, and I'm the owner of Formaggio Kitchen, and I'm excited to welcome you to the uh, version of Voyage Formage. Uh, the theme this month is cooking with cheese, uh, which is something near and dear to my heart. Um, and so hopefully this will inspire you all to um, utilize cheese not only as mm -hmm. something to enjoy, but something to um, something to utilize and cook with. Um, and so what we're gonna do today is a little bit different than our previous classes. Um, I'm gonna show you some step-by-step -step instructions on how to actually cook with these cheeses. Um, you know, for the past few days, I have been making these recipes and videoing them so that we wouldn't be doing it live so that I can pay more attention to you and your questions. But beyond that, the biggest takeaway that I wanted everybody to have for tonight's class is that, um, in my opinion, and cheese is just, in the world of food is all about opinions. There's no right and wrongs. Um, but in my opinion, cheese is, um, certain cheeses aren't necessarily cooking cheeses and certain cheeses aren't necessarily eating cheeses. Um, cheese is delicious and wonderful and uh, multifaceted. And so you can have cheeses that are fantastic to snack on. Um, you know, just like we talked about last month with some of those incredible Parmesans, um, you can have a cheese that's wonderful for cooking application, but also just delicious to eat on its own. Um, so we are going to explore some really traditional recipes. A lot of these are recipes found um, in the uh, Swiss and French Alps. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the origin of these recipes and kind of how they came about. Um, some of them are ancient recipes, some of them are a bit newer, but either way, it's really meant to highlight and enjoy the cheese. Um, so without further ado, we are going to start. Um, does everybody have all of their cheeses in front of you or uh, recipes? Um, does anybody have any questions before we get started? All right. So I know this one is a little bit different because we gave you four different recipes and five different cheeses. We went a little overboard today on this one, but um, we wanted to give you the tools to be able to taste the cheeses um, during the class if you wanted to or um, you can execute the recipes on your own, or you can do a little bit of both um, because all of these cheeses are fantastic on their own to snack on. And you can kind of get a sense of um, the different characteristics, um, but you can also um, utilize those recipes. And I've got a few tricks um, to share with you to make these even easier to execute at home. Um, all right, so the first recipe that I'm sure everybody is familiar with is fondue. And I love all different fondue recipes. And I think, again, the clear thing is, is that there is no right or wrong recipe with fondue. Um, we provided a recipe and hopefully you all got the updated recipe because the original one was not correct that was um a little bit more savoyard style fondue which is almost like a cheese soup which i did not want to provide for you um so we gave you an updated recipe which is a more classic fondue where you can really get that sort of ooey gooey um sort of cheesy pull when you um have your fondue um a key element obviously in the fondue is the mixture of the cheese um i love just, I'm not a pitch, but I really love my grater for my KitchenAid attachment. It makes grating the cheese really, really simple. And so um, you really don't uh, skip this part, even if you um, 
even if you don't have an attachment like this, use a box grater. Don't cube up the cheeses. Um, you're going to get a better result if you grate it properly um, because the cheese is going to melt a lot easier. Um, talk about the cheeses that we are um, using for this particular fondue recipe. This is a slightly milder fondue. Uh, this is a blend of Comté and the Emmentaler. And um, these are two cheeses. Uh, one is on the French side of the Alps and the other is on the Swiss side of the Alps. Um, both are massive, massive cheeses. The Comté is 80 pound wheels and the Emmentaler is actually a 200 pound wheel um, that we received over the holidays. Um, and the reason these cheeses are so wonderful to use in fondue is because they create they are younger and sweeter and grassier. Um, we used one of the youngest comtés that we have. We have um, at any given time at least six comtés, up to eight different comtés in our shop. And for your base of your fondue, you really want these melty, mild cheeses. Um, and then you can build flavor on top of that. And so in your collection of cheeses, we did give you a raclette, which we're going to talk about later. But raclette is actually one of my favorite cheeses to add into fondue. You can add more pungent cheeses to your fondue to layer on top of your base layer. But what we gave you is the most classic everyday approachable fondue, which when you taste the cheeses, you will understand why they're such a good base layer. And if you want to add super nutty, intense cheeses, you can add maybe a quarter pound or a half a pound of like a really intense cheese to balance out maybe a pound of mild cheese. Um, and that's so that you get a balance of flavor and that you're not sort of overwhelming yourself with um, too much intensity. Because when you heat cheese, it's really important to remember that a lot of the elements are going to get stronger. So if you have a cheese that's really pungent and vibrant and bold while it's at room temperature, it's actually going to get even more intense when you heat it in your fondue. So if you only use really intense cheeses, you're, you might get, you know, knocked over the head of it. It's going to be, it could be too intense. Um, but the key is, is to play around. And frankly, the best way to kind of utilize fridge scraps, if you, if you have trouble finishing your cheese, um, hopefully no one does, but if you do, it's a really great way to utilize because it doesn't have to be a very specific blend. Um, for me, the key is just having that base layer of sweet Alpine mild cheeses, and then, and then you create the flavor profile on top of that, that suits kind of your needs and your desires. Um, and so when you're tasting the Comte, um, I imagine that you're tasting a really nice, light, delicate fruitiness, much different than some of the aged comtés that we've had before. Um, and then with the with the Emmentaler, um, you get a little bit more of that sort of savory quality, very, very creamy, um, and a really, really uh, nice, smooth texture. Um, you get a little bit more bite because of the gassiness of the cheese. And the, the gassiness is what causes those eyes, the big holes in Swiss cheese. Um, it's a buildup of carbon, uh, carbon dioxide, and it creates those big uh, eyes in the cheese. And that actually does impact the flavor. And so you can get a little bit more intensity in that, um, in a cheese like that. Um, so next up after, shredding the cheese. Um, basically, you're going to take your garlic and you're going to crush it. You don't have to, but in my opinion, if you don't crush the garlic, uh, you lose out on so much of the flavor. And um, what you're going to do next is combine your white wine and your garlic and heat it up gently. And you're basically using this as an opportunity to infuse the flavor of the garlic into the wine. And as I mentioned before, there are so many different fondue recipes depending on, you know, regional traditions. Um, so there are some recipes that will cut the garlic in half and you literally rub the fondue pot with your, um, with your garlic. Um, but 
this is a recipe that we know and love. Um, and so while the garlic and the white wine are heating up in a separate little container, and this is a, um, a little bit less traditional, I think, um, to what you see most frequently online. Um, but I really like the slurry. Um, so what I did there is I um, put a little bit of apple brandy, about four tablespoons, um, and your, um, your flour. And you make a slurry by just heating it up and whisking it gently. And there are a lot of different methods for preventing the separation and clumping of your cheese when you melt the cheese. If you don't add an element like flour or cornstarch, then oftentimes your fondue will start to split and separate and you're gonna get a sort of cheesy mass and an oily mass. And it's really important that you add some sort of, um, you don't have to, but it will help your fondue's longevity, um, especially if you're not serving it immediately from the stove, uh, to add an element like that. With the slurry, I really like using it because it is, uh, it incorporates so beautifully. Um, so in this video, it just shows you, you just heat it up so that it's, um, starting to bubble a little bit and then right before you pour it you want to whisk it so that it's very smooth and the goal with making the slurry not only is to incorporate the eau de vie um it, but it is also to um prevent the clumping of the the flour um so in this case um this is where we have the white wine has been heated and we pour the slurry in it and then you just whisk it in with you can see the cheese has been added and melted and that's it um and then you uh continue to cook it for a few minutes over high heat um you want to actually let the flour and that slurry start to thicken the the fondue a little bit and to uh create a really nice consistency and then you pour it into your fondue pot and you are ready to go. Um, so that is fondue in a nutshell. You really can play around with it a bit. Um, you can tinker and figure out what is your favorite recipe. If you're gluten-free, um, you can still make a lovely fondue. You just wanna use cornstarch instead of the flour. And oftentimes I've found it easiest if you uh, just toss the cornstarch in uh, with the cheese. And it tends to coat the shredded cheese really nicely. So again, if you're gluten-free and you can't use a, a traditional slurry, then, um, then that's a really nice way to go. Um, if I were at home making fondue, you have, you know, a third of a pound of the Conte, a third of a pound of the Emmentaler. You could throw in a third of a pound of the Raclette and make a really beautiful, uh, really nice strong pungent fondue that would be really nice um and that's it and my favorite way to utilize the fondue is obviously the classic dipping with bread but then roasted potatoes and you'll see that's a theme with all of these is roasted potatoes but um does anybody have any questions before we move on to the next cheese no how does everybody like the comte and the emmentaler Hi Julia. Hi. Thanks, Max. Hi Maxine. I didn't like I didn't like this comte. And most yeah. of them I find are a very direct sort of taste. This one just seemed muddled. I was yeah. really surprised. This is the youngest one in the bunch. And so it is, this is actually pretty close to the age when they test the wheels. So it hasn't had time to develop a lot of that sort of nutty or oniony flavor profile, most of what you're getting is lightly sweet and a little bit of that sort of lactic milkiness, but a very mild, like if somebody came in and said, I want a really mild snacking cheese, this would be the way to go. Um, but that's the, the utilization of this cheese, in my opinion, in the fondue is less for the sort of over arching flavor and more for that um that base uh layer of a texture but then b 
Um, having a cheese that's milder and just lightly sweet lets you layer on the flavors really, really nicely on top of that. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Anybody else? And what about the Emmentaler? This is actually a pretty rare Emmentaler, mostly in the United States. Emmentaler is brought in already pre-cut um, because there's not a whole lot of cheese counters that can handle a um, 200 and uh, 200 to 250 pound wheel. Ours came in just over 200 pounds. Um, so what did what did you all think of that? That one I really liked. It had a lot of uh, a lot of flavor to it, and I could see how it would add something to the fondue. Yeah, and I think the key too with fondue is using lots of cheeses, different types of cheeses, because every cheese has different qualities, and you just you're build it's a building block. You're building flavors on top of one another. Um, all right, so the next cheese we're going to be Julia, what's the diameter of that cheese, the two hundred and fifty pound cheese? How big um, is? It? Let me th let me think. Um, it is probably thirty six to forty eight inches. I would say probably closer to forty eight inches. Wow. Well, because I mean, it's massive. I um, hold on. I might. This is going to be, well, if you go to our Instagram page, um, we have a photo of it, of our, um, so this is, do you, can you all see? So that's yeah, so Mark, that's our cheese, Mark. I, that's Mark, our uh, head cheesemonger and buyer. Uh, this is him breaking the wheel. Hi. It's huge. Wow. Thanks. And Mark's a big guy. Mark is, yeah, Mark is a big guy. He's tall, so he'll actually put it on. You can see it's just absolutely massive. And if you've been into the shop and you've seen how big that marble is that he has it on, it is, it's massive. So it's, it is the biggest wheel we've ever, it might, well, it's, it might be the second biggest wheel we've ever brought in. One time we did bring in a Gouda that was just, enormous um it, i think they probably hmm julia how long would that last the store how if, long would we, it... if we didn't cut into it it would no last... no 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 but how, how long would it how long would it take in other words as you sell it uh, oh okay well it depends on so the emmentaler took um probably about two months uh well, we got it, yeah, about two months because we're basically finished finishing up with it right now. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, we got it at the end of November. And so it's, but again, it depends. We buy very strategically. So we would never buy that right now because it is a slower time of year and we wouldn't right. want to have it over the summertime. And I think that um, it's just the perfect wheel to bring in during the holiday season because it's ideal for fondue and other recipes, but then also it's, again, like it's a really nice snacking cheese. So we don't want to think about cheese again. Like we don't want to bring a cheese and say, oh, this is only for cooking. Um, mm -hmm. It's really nice to have that versatility. And it's just so cool to have, you know, Swiss, Swiss cheese, so to speak, has been, um, has become very sort of homogenized in the world, I think. And, you know, we, people come in and ask for Swiss cheese and they're, you know, expecting just really bland cheese with, with holes in it. And so it's really exciting to see a more artisanal um, production of Emmentaler because the sort of Swiss cheese that we know and love on sandwiches really does originate from Emmentaler. But unfortunately, we're losing a lot of the sort of traditional cheese making practices that go into having a wheel that big and that special. And so um, we were able to find a producer that still does source from small dairies to, to make that wheel. So it's very, Julia, very special. <laughs> Julie, what's the advantage of making such a big wheel? <clears throat> well, so there's a few different reasons for it. Um, the biggest reason is oftentimes location um, and, um aging 
So there's actually a really big problem going on right now in the caves um, in Parmesan um, because there's no set size requirement for Parmesan cheese. And so what they're finding is the makers are making the cheeses bigger and bigger and bigger because they're able to fit more in the caves. It's much easier to fit you know, 200 wheels that are 100 pounds than, um, you know, something that's a little bit smaller, which would take up more cave, which Parmesan wheels are typically around 80 pounds and they're skewing up and up and up. Um, you know, each year it's getting heavier and heavier. Um, when you look at traditional cheese making, and I love using Comte um, as the example, Think about this cheese and the logistics of making a cheese like this in the 1700s. Um, when you're at the top of the mountain, like in, in the Alps, and you need to bring this cheese to a village to sell. Um, you know, whether you are sending it to someone who will then take it to Paris or elsewhere, but you need to transport this wheel effectively from the top of a mountain down to a village uh, or a town. And so when you have a really large, heavy wheel um, with a really massive surface area, it really is great and conducive for shipping. Um, and so that definitely does play a role into the size of a cheese like that. Um, but yeah, it really, it's, it's kind of fascinating um, to look at the origins of why cheeses are that way uh, with Comte as well, though, because it's a cooked pressed cheese. Um, it's a raw milk cheese, as is the Emmentaler, but Comte is the cooked pressed cheese. So it uh, they do not use salt to extract the moisture in the cheese. Um, they actually gently, after the curd and the whey have been separated, um, they you have your big vat of cheese curd. Um, and that forms the base of your wheel of cheese. And, to, you know, oftentimes you would, you know, blend that with a, a, lot, a good amount of salt and that would help expel a lot of moisture from the cheese. However, being in the top of the Alps, you're not going to have easy access to a lot of salt because you're in the middle of the mountains. And so another method for expelling moisture from cheese is heat and pressing. And so what they do is you have your massive wheel, which is not, Comte is only about that tall, actually. It's very, very large in surface area, but really not terribly tall. And um, you have a nice wooden frame that all that curd gets put into, and then a wide round wooden press, essentially, that you would crank. And this is all over heat. And so as you're cranking, you're gently warming the curd. And so the combination of the pressure and the heat helps to expel that moisture. And that's why when you have a cheese like Comte, it has that really silky texture and you don't get the eyes in the cheese because it has been, you really, um, that would be a negative quality in Comte if you saw a big eye in it. You'd want to see um, that smooth, silky texture. Um, so I digress a little bit. But so there's a ton of reasons. And the other reason is aging and storage because you can age a very large cheese for much longer. Whereas, so the Emmentaler, for example, you could eat that at a year old and it would be perfectly fine, but you could also eat it at five years old. Um, it would be a very different cheese, but if you had a much smaller wheel, you really have a much shorter lifespan. So um, the smaller the wheel, the shorter the lifespan. So a lot of it plays into, you know, what are your intent? What is your intention with the cheese and how long do you want to store it? How long do you expect to store it? So um, definitely a lot goes into thinking about the size of the cheese. Any other questions? <clears throat> All right. Sorry for my dog whining. I had a lot. Whenever there's cheese everywhere, then she gets very upset when she doesn't get any. Thanks, Julia. You're welcome. You're welcome. So next is, um, so the next photo is actually a photo of um, Reblichon. 
And so the next cheese we're going to be enjoying is Ton de Verbier. Um, and as maybe some of you know, Reblochon is, is um, not legal in the United States. And uh, Reblochon is from the uh, Savoie region of France. Um, again, another Alpine cheese. And I think this really demonstrates a beautiful example of that style of cheese being cooked and utilized when we were in the Savoie last year. Um, this is how we enjoyed Reblochon. Um, so the cheese that you're enjoying is what we bring in as a substitute for Ribblechon. Um, this is a cheese called Pomme de Verbier. Um, it is made using a Ribblechon recipe um, and it is pretty extraordinary. It's from Switzerland. Um, it's got that incredible rich creaminess um, that is absolutely fantastic. Um, and let me see. Oh. This is a video. Uh, wait a second. The older gentleman is the chief maker, and the younger gentleman is the son. So the older gentleman in red is the cheesemaker. The younger uh, gentleman is his son learning the practice. Um, and right now in this video there, delivering their cheeses, uh, their Reblochon, to um, an affineur, someone who ages the cheese for them. Um, Reblochon is a massively popular cheese in the Savoie. Um, the recipe that we included for you for Reblochon is a incredibly traditional recipe uh, utilizing it uh, called Tartiflette. Now, Reblechon is an ancient cheese. The recipe is not. The recipe is actually from around the 80s. Um, but Reblechon itself is from the um, from the 17th century, I believe. Um, and it's a pretty fascinating cheese where um, the 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 folks who um, the cheesemakers had their herds of cows and they were essentially um, tariffed um, for utilizing the grazing grounds and the high alpage uh, pastures. And so the way that they were tariffed was actually by, um, they would come around and they would measure the milk output. And so based on that is how they would tariff these farmers and cheesemakers. And so the farmers got very wise to this and would milk only half of what was um, essentially possible in the morning uh, when they knew that they would be coming to inspect. And then they would save the rest of the milk for the evening um, so that they would be taxed a lesser amount. And the term that they used for this was uh, reblechonne, which um, essentially meant to strip um, or to, to, to foil to, um, to scam, so to speak. And so what ended up happening is they um, would save the evening milk, uh, the evening milking for uh, making reblechon. Um, which is how it got the name uh, Reblochon from Reblochonne. And um, it, the evening milking um, had a richer, higher fat content from the cows grazing all day. And it ended up creating a really fat, rich, intense cheese. And the cheeses that were made, they basically, Reblochon was originally made and kind of hidden. Um, it wasn't sold. It wasn't produced. Um, it was a way to kind of hide the excess milk that they were trying to not be taxed for. And so they would enjoy it and keep it basically exclusive to themselves and the farms um, without sharing it in the public. Eventually, the tariffs ended and um, right around the French Revolution, um, it became sold more widely. And... Um, that's when it sort of exploded in popularity and then it kind of dipped again and 
in the 80s, a restaurant, um, there was always a, a classic recipe for a tartiflette, which was um, just using the scraps of, uh, of uh, reblochon and um, potatoes and creme fraiche. And it would just make us very simple sort of bake, essentially. Um, well, a restaurant added some white wine and uh, lardon, which is um, just rendered bacon, essentially. And um, it became massively popular and sort of revitalized uh, this dish or this um, sort of peasant dish that didn't really have a name. Um, and so that's when it really was sort of created as tartiflette was in the 80s. Um, and what tartiflette is, is uh, basically at its base, just a potato casserole with melted cheese on top. Um, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, when you have the Tome de Verbier, you can see the quality of that cheese and why it would, uh, when you melt it, it just becomes oozier and richer. It's sometimes can be on the pungent side, but you know, not always. So it does have some variability. Um, this is a wash rind cheese, which does tend to be slightly more pungent in, um, in style, but um, I'd love to know what you think about the the Tome de Verbier uh, that you're tasting because it really is probably one of the closest um, the closest versions to true Robochon that you can get in the United States. Any thoughts? Do you like it? It's great. I actually thought it was going to be more pungent than it um, than it is. The it looks the bark is worse than its bite. It really looks. <laughs> intense um and the wheels can get to be really ripe but what always strikes me about this cheese is the intense milkiness if that makes sense um yeah. it's just very lactic and and i just love it i think it's yeah. magnificent awesome we yeah know. and melted over some potatoes is just otherworldly. <laughs> But again, it's the type of cheese that you can completely enjoy on its own. Um, and it doesn't have to be in a dish to be delicious. Um, but it definitely doesn't hurt. Um, all right. So the next cheese uh, that we are. Julia? Yeah. Sorry. I just So you alluded to, so I guess some cheese neophytes here. Um, why is it not legal in the U.S.? It's a really good question. That's wrong. No. So, Cheese must be aged over 60 days um, to be allowed in the, uh, in the United States to be raw milk. Uh, Reblochon is a protected recipe. And so because of that, Reblochon has a distinct size and shape uh, and it must be raw milk by law. And so um, as I was saying with the par Parmesan is, is unique in that it doesn't have a size requirement. Oftentimes these protected cheeses, um, DOP, AOP, um, do require a certain size. And as I was saying before, the smaller the cheese, the shorter the lifespan. And so when you get a small wheel of cheese that is, and it's not, it cannot arrive in the U.S. at 60 days, it must depart France, it, it must depart the creamery or the affineur where it's aging at 60 days. And that's the key determination because then it's just at that point, it's too, too old essentially. Um, and the cheese doesn't really hold up well. So that is why, and honestly, even if you tried to bring Reblochon in, um, that was like the, the, they would never, Customs and Border Patrol would never let it in ever in a million years because they know there are certain key cheeses that they look out for. And Reblochon is one of the main ones. Reblochon, Brie de Mo, things that they know are traditionally young raw milk cheeses and are must be young raw milk cheeses. And so you would be, it would not be who of you to even attempt it because it would still get held up and they would have to do testing and you would have to prove unequivocally that it left the farm or or the cheesemaker or the affineur at 60 days but most likely the fda would just destroy it um so it, it just it wouldn't be worth it 
Um, and so that's why we just essentially call it a banned cheese um, in the United States. And we've had a lot of waves of banned cheeses in the United States. Um, but that one is um, really, it's the, the law that makes it very, and the, the fact that it must be, uh, it must by law be raw milk. That's what makes it basically impossible to, um, to bring in. But if you're in France, you can buy it regularly and, <laughs> and it's fantastic. So I, it's one of those special cheeses that, you know, when you are in France, um, it's one that you should definitely get because it's just unlike, um, it's really, it's just, it's special and it's unlike a lot of other cheeses. So, um, but I will say this one is a very, very close substitute. Any other questions? All right, so the next one is very basic, and so we won't spend too much time on it, but it's delightful, and it's called Little Hosmer. Um, and Little Hosmer is not basic. I don't want to undermine the cheese, but the recipe is very simple, but it is such an easy way to utilize um, a little bit of jam, you know, if you have leftover jam in your fridge or, um, you know, a small brie. I, I love this. And this is the way you don't have to do brie en croute, which brie en croute is a brie wrapped in puff pastry that's baked. Um, you don't have to fuss that much. Um, I think it's just really, really nice to be able to do something simple. So this is how I prepare it. Um, I like to just cut an X into the top of the cheese. Um, and then I gently, as gently as possible, uh, fold back the rind a little bit. Um, because my goal is to get the jam in the cheese. Um, it's not necessary. You could sort of smear the jam right on top of the cheese. But I think that if you make a little pocket and then bake it, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, you want to put it in a dish because depending on how much you bake it, it will start to ooze. Um, and so I just use a French onion soup dish. Uh, it works really well, um, depending on the size of your cheese. I used, um, you all have the apricot jam from Confiture de Raphael. Um, I used a little bit of strawberry rhubarb that I had in my fridge, um, but the Confiture de Raphael apricot is absolutely wonderful. And that's it. And that's just, the recipe is to bake at about 350 degrees for five minutes. That's if you want to warm it through. If you want it bubbly and oozy and really sort of a whole different um, beast, then you can increase the temperature to 375 and do it for about 10 minutes. So you can really do it to taste. If you do it uh, following the recipe to a tea, um, you're basically going to have a really nice, warm, slightly oozy cheese. Um, but you can always crank it up a bit if you want to have something a little bit more intense and, um, and rich. Um, and Little Hosmer is basically a little uh, brie style cheese uh, from Vermont. They're from the cellars the Jas at Jasper Hill. And you've got that bloomy white uh, rind, which is really critical for a cheese like uh, for doing the baked brie. You want a cheese that's a little bit more pungent in the world of brie um and just because if you're pairing it with such a sweet jam you get a really nice balance of a little bit of that sort of intense mushroominess with um a nice sweet jam but you can also pick a really really mild brie if that's your preference i would just go for a milder jam in that case maybe not something so intense um the, the jam that you have, I hope you like, um, probably one of our most popular jams. Um, it's from Brittany, France, and it's all handmade in copper pots. And apricot is, I feel like, a underappreciated flavor of jam in the U.S. <laughs> um, it is so, so popular in France, and it is wonderful. Um really good with cheeses because it has such a rich buttery quality but also a really nice tartness um and just uh i think a lovely jam overall to pair with cheeses um but that was a simple one does anybody have any questions all right 
So the last cheese of the night is one of my all-time favorites. Oh, there we go. We're going to talk about raclette. Um, raclette is another alpine cheese. And again, you see a theme here. Um, but it all makes sense because if you're living in the Alps, um, it can be very cold and it's really, really nice to have cheeses like this that are warm and soothing. Um, but I will say when we were in the Alps, it was hot. Um, it was September, um, and we were eating baked Reblochon, you know, on top of a mountain drinking cold wine. So it's it's not a seasonal food for the Alps. It really is a year round food, but um, but it is where it originated. Um, this cheese that you have is uh, Raclette de Verbier um, from Verbier, Switzerland. So um, also the same region as the Tome de Verbier that you just had, but a very, very different style of cheese. This cheese is one of my all-time favorite snacking cheeses. Um, raclette tends to be known for cooking, but it is this cheese with a dry Riesling is an absolute showstopper. I think it's so, so good. It's a washer and cheese, which means, um, you know, you have a wheel that is fairly large, um, not nearly as big as a Comte. I'd say each wheel is about four to five kilos. And, um, you have, it's got, it's a very high fat content cheese, which allows it to, um, melt incredibly nicely. And it's a, they call it, um, a, a semi-firm cheese, but because it is not too aged, it lends itself incredibly well to melting. Um, the wash drying process we've talked about in previous classes, but I will go over it again really quickly where you have your wheel of cheese after you've you know, formed the wheel of cheese. It's a baby brand new cheese. It's only a day or two old. And you actually take a, a brine solution and you wash the outside of the cheese and you flip it and you wash the outside of the cheese and you flip it. What that does is it creates a bacterial growth um, on the outside of the cheese called Brevi bacterium, which causes that sort of orange red color in, on the rind of the cheese and creates that pungent smell that you know and love in a lot of cheeses. And the other thing that it does is it helps retain the moisture on the inside of the cheese, which helps significantly with um, uh, the sort of meltability of this cheese. Um, so in this picture here, you have a traditional raclette machine. So we break out this machine a lot nowadays. Um, and it has a heating element on the top. And traditionally, you would take a half a wheel or a quarter wheel and the arms of the cheese or the arms of the machine actually tilt downward so you get direct heat right on that on the paste of the cheese where it was cut and it starts to bubble and then you take the cheese and you scrape it over uh potatoes um you can also scrape it in you know on bread or i've done maple roasted brussels sprouts which was awesome so there's a number of ways to enjoy it and the name raclette actually comes from the french word to scrape um so it is exactly what you're supposed to do is just kind of really melt the heck out of it and then scrape it um but not everybody has a raclette machine um, nor does everybody need to eat a quarter of a wheel of cheese. Um, and so there's a lot of really good cheat methods for enjoying a raclette at your house. Um, and one way, again, this is not a cheese that has to be cooked. I love to eat this cheese just on a cheese plate. But if you want to experience raclette, uh, you can just slice it with your knife, um, kind of as thin as you can. You keep the rind on and um, you can put it in a pan and sear it pretty hot and just melt the cheese and pour it over your potatoes. Alternatively, one cheat method that I've done, and this is, um, I made this dish at my brother's house in Oregon um, over actually a 
in January, so a few weeks ago, and I brought, well, I pretty much brought a suitcase full of cheese, but one of those was a package of sliced raclette, and I roasted potatoes. I laid the raclette over the potatoes, and then I uh, broiled it, and slightly different but really really nice out like it you get a slightly drier version here um but it was fantastic and it was still ooey and gooey and it's a really great way to enjoy the cheese without having to deal with a machine or stovetop or anything like that um yes i i it's just it's it's such an easy recipe i highly recommend you try it but again um just like i was saying before um it does get um the cheese will get stronger as it gets heated so you want to make sure that you balance it out so raclette de verbier uh, from verbier switzerland um, is what you're enjoying tonight which is going to be on the more pungent side of the scale uh, we also have raclette amorge which is the most pungent raclette that we have um but then you can taper it down a bit there's raclette de savoie which is the french side of the alps which is a little bit milder and then there's domestic raclette style cheeses which are even milder so you can kind of pick and choose uh what you're looking for and what you're interested in as far as strength and pungency um but that is that is all I have for you tonight. Um, I hope that you enjoyed it. Does anybody have any questions? No, but that was wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. So I wanted to t let you all know that, um, well, typically there's supposed to be four cheeses in Voyage Fromage, and I've not been very good at sticking to that, and I'm not going to be very good at sticking to that next week either, uh, or next month. Um, so just a sneak preview, um, next month we're going to be doing a vertical tasting of uh, five different Comtes. So we're going to be able to taste really the difference between every single age. Um, and wine she would say to go with that? Sorry? Which which wines uh, with the, with the Comte next when we test those next month when we go up through the aging? Oh, which wine would you recommend? I would recommend a Cote de Jura Sauvignon. Definitely a million percent that a Cote de Jura is traditional to have with Comte, um, and you can have a few different. There are a few different varieties. Uh, the Sauvignon is my absolute favorite, and I think it would work nicely with the young and the old. Can you send that when you send the um, the information out? Absolutely, absolutely. That would be great. Definitely. And then add a bottle um, to the to the order. Can you add a bottle to the order? <laughs> if you live in Massachusetts. Yeah. All right. Well, we can. We'll we'll all reach out and we'll we'll set you up. Let, let's okay. Step, let's step up the game. Yeah. <laughs> Challenge accepted. Um, and then um, the following month, we've um, partnered with Neil's Yard Dairy, um, and they have, um, what they do is they source cheeses from the British Isles, and they have a cave in London um, where they store and age uh, their cheeses. And so they're going to be giving us, uh, we're going to be doing a really special tasting with them, featuring some very unique, small um small producers from the UK. And um, Yvonne is going to actually give us a tour of the cave uh, from London. So so keep keep on tap for this. So those are the next two months. So lots of exciting things coming up. All right. Any other questions before we go? Julie, we'd also love that bottle of wine with it. So thank you. You're Let's, welcome. Let us know what it is. Absolutely. I absolutely will. I Ter just took a little. I just took my little hauser out of the oven with the oh, yeah. hot jam. It's <laughs> oh good. I'm so yeah, it's glad. So good. It's so I'm good. not gonna lie. I um I did that video this morning, and so that was my breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Julia, that was really great fun tonight. It was great. Thank, Thank you. Great. Oh, good. Thank I'm glad you. you enjoyed Thank it. You. If, you, if you have any further questions, don't hesitate to email, and we're happy to answer any of your cheese questions. So so 
grateful that you joined us tonight and have an absolutely wonderful yeah. night.